Welcome to our Catechism class. It's a weekly look at the Heidelberg Catechism to help you learn Christian doctrine with a warm and practical application. Each lesson has its own study guide, and the web link to find that guide can be found in the episode notes. Okay, let's start the lesson. So welcome to our Catechism class. And today we have reached the very last Lord's Day of the Heidelberg Catechism, although not by any means our last Catechism class. So the Catechist finishes his teaching on the Lord's Prayer with three questions, question 127 to question 129. And we're going to do just one of them in this lesson. We're going to look at question 127, where the Catechist asks us, what is the sixth petition? And our answer must be, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. That is, in ourselves we are so weak that we cannot stand even for a moment. Moreover, our sworn enemies, the devil, the world, and our own flesh, do not cease to attack us. Will you therefore uphold and strengthen us by the power of your Holy Spirit, so that in this spiritual war we may not go down to defeat, but always firmly resist our enemies, until finally we obtain the complete victory. I'm Bob McAvoy, and this is the Semper Reformata Podcast. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 13, Jesus teaches us to pray. He says, And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, I have always found the wording of that petition of the Lord's Prayer rather challenging. Here's a hard question Would God ever lead us into temptation? Now, let's not gloss quickly over this. Let's look at that problem first. And then we look at the wording of the Catechism itself. So is the wording of this petition a plea for God not to toy with us by deliberately placing temptation in our way? Is it the case that God wants to trip us up? And so in the petition we are asking him not to? Well, of course not. We know that God is not capricious. We know that he never changes. We know that he never wants us to stumble and fall. He wants to bring us all to heavenly glory. And that's abundantly clear right throughout the scriptures. Yet there are two parts to this petition. Firstly, that God in his mercy and grace will deliver us from all evil. And of course he does. But yet at the same time, when we read this petition, we're conscious that he is sovereign. We're conscious that there is nothing that is outside his power and command, and the implication is that everything that happens to us, whether good or bad, is in some sense ordained by God. If you want biblical evidence of this, let's just take one text. Look at how Moses spoke about the way the Lord brought his people through the wilderness. It's found in Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 2 to 3. And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these forty years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you and let you hunger, and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Some years ago, I visited a Christian man in hospital. He was just 40 years of age and had a wife and a family and a farm and a lively faith in God. But he'd just been diagnosed with an aggressive cancer. 
he'd been told by the doctor to put his affairs in order. That day in the hospital I sat beside him, and I honestly confess that I didn't know what to say. I had no words to comfort him. Everything I wanted to say seemed to sound to me like I was feeding him with some kind of platitudes. I simply couldn't put myself in his shoes, couldn't bear to think about it. So I decided to be honest, and I admitted, I'm so sorry, I really just don't know what to say to you. His reply, rightly, was a mild rebuke. He said you could just say, as for God, his way is perfect. A few weeks later, he was in heaven with the Lord. I suppose if we have doubts about the sovereignty of God in our own lives, we should spend some time reading a book of Job. Perhaps we'd even reach the same conclusion that Job reached. For he said, even though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Job 13 and verse 15. Job had suffered greatly in a period of deep testing, and yet his faith in God had not wavered. But then again, while God ordains all of our ways, and while his way is always perfect, is he directly responsible for the temptation that's put in our way each and every day? Well, Martin Luther certainly didn't think so. Martin Luther, teaching on the Lord's Prayer, wrote, God certainly tempts no one to sin. But we pray in this petition that God would guard and keep us so that the devil, the world and our own flesh may not deceive us or lead us into misbelief, despair or other shameful sin and vice. And though we be thus tempted, that we may still in the end overcome and retain the victory. So it's a difficult enough petition, but the Catechist will help us with it in question 127. And I want to sum it up in one simple, easy phrase, almost in the words of a song. I'm going to sum it up like this. I am weak, but he is strong. I am weak, but he is strong. I'm going to look at those two simple explanations. Let's think, I am weak. Catechus says in ourselves, we are so weak that we cannot stand even for a moment. Our instructor reminds us here of our own human weakness. This petition is very challenging for us. It gets right to the heart of our problem that even as believers we are still subject to temptation and to sin, to yielding to that temptation. I remind you again of Luther's Latin phrase, Simul Eustus et Peccator. We are simultaneously sinners and at the same time forgiven saints. We are weak and the Lord knows our weakness. Here's our Matthew Henry prayer. Lord, for as much as there is in us a determination to turn away from you, so that when our sins are forgiven, even then we are ready to return to folly. So we pray that you would not only forgive us our debts, but take care of us, that we may not do wrong again. Lord, lead us not into temptation. God knows all about our weakness. In Psalm 103 he says, For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. As a flower of the field, so he flourishes. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and the place, its place, remembers it no more. Bad enough that we're weak human beings. But we have terrible enemies arraigned against us. The Catechist actually lists three great enemies of the soul. He talks about our sworn enemies, the devil, the world, and our own flesh, do not cease to attack us. These are our sworn enemies, and it's their desire and purpose to inflict mortal wounds on the believer's soul. Let's try and identify them. The devil, we would expect nothing less. 
in the wilderness in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 1. Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. It's the devil's job, it's his task, it's his calling, it's his devilish and fiendish desire to tempt us. Now, like in the case of Job, sometimes God will allow the devil to test us. But he will not allow us to be tempted beyond what we can bear. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13, Paul writes, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Perhaps the devil attacks us when we least expect it, comes to us in guises we would scarcely recognise. Paul startles us when he tells us in 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 14 that Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Imagine Satan being dressed in the attire of a light-bringing messenger brings to mind the fact that he might be disguised as a church minister. Someone we think is feeding us from God's word, but is so distorting the Bible's message that he is actually doing the very work of the devil himself. And sometimes that messenger can seem so attractive. Perhaps he will have a lifestyle that would make us envious, have a charming personality and smile at us through shiny white teeth. But don't be deceived. Remember that in this passage, Paul has been warning against false apostles. In 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 14. So we need to be exercising some spiritual discernment. The devil will tempt us. The world is our enemy. The world hates Christianity. Satan frequently uses the people of this world to further his aims, to trip Christians up. Every time a liberal minister casts doubt upon God's word. Every time a university professor teaches evolution as a fact and not just a theory. Every time a primary school teacher teaches the government's liberal gender program. Every time a doctor performs an abortion. Every time a radio presenter mocks Christ and believers. Every time a man or a woman uses enticing bodily temptation, Satan is using that person to further his aims, driving them into greater judgment before God, the devil, the world. My own flesh is my enemy. Romans chapter 7 and verse 23. But I see in my members another law waging against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Galatians 5 and verse 17 For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh for these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Isn't the greatest danger to my soul, my own heart? My heart which is deceitful, desperately wicked. And we're asking our Heavenly Father to lead us out of and away from temptation. To protect us from ourselves and from our own wicked sinful hearts. Implied in the position is that when God leads us, we're safe. Whereas when we follow our own lead, we go astray and we wander into dangerous ways. One American pastor wrote, Nothing in the universe appears so deformed and odious as my own sinful heart. But as much as I discover about the deformity and the vileness of my heart, I know that God discovers a thousand times more than I do, for he knows my heart altogether. So the catechist makes the point that we are weak. In ourselves we are so weak that we cannot stand even for a moment. Our weakness is compounded 
by the terrible enemies that are arraigned against us, our sworn enemies, the devil, the world, my own flesh. And that's why we need to pray this prayer. And so we come to my second point. We are weak, but he is strong. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 13 is an oft-quoted verse. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. We gain our strength from the Lord. So the Catechist says, Will you therefore uphold and strengthen us by the power of your Holy Spirit, so that in this spiritual war we may not go down to defeat, but always firmly resist our enemies until we finally obtain the complete victory. So despite the fact that we are unable to resist temptation in our own strength, we are required to resist that temptation. We are required to stand firm, for we are engaged in a war. And Paul stresses this over and over again in his Armour of God passage in Ephesians chapter 6. Look at how many times he tells us in that chapter that we must stand. In Ephesians 6 and verse 11 to 14, Put on the whole armour of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armour of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore. But standing's hard, isn't it? Standing is relentless, grinding hard work, yet we must take our stand and we must remain standing throughout and we must not fall. But thankfully we have great resources and the catechist lists them for us in this answer. Of course, one of those resources is prayer itself. This petition is taught to us in the context of Christ's model prayer. Watch and pray, he says, in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 41. Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation, for the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. We've got prayer as a resource. We've got the sustaining and keeping power of God. This is the right prayer to pray when times of temptation come along to seek the help of the Lord who is able to deliver us from evil and from the evil one, to simply ask the Lord to uphold us by his mighty power. The words of Deuteronomy chapter 33 and verse 26 to 28 are so relevant here. And there we find that great promise that the eternal God is your dwelling place and underneath are the everlasting arms. So we have the resource of prayer. We have the resource of the sustaining and keeping power of God. And we have the indwelling Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 5 and verse 3 to 5. We rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character. Character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Who has been given unto us. Now it is only through the use of these great resources, through complete reliance on the Lord, that we are capped and that we do not go down into defeat. Instead, with God's help we overcome and we gain the victory in Christ. As the Catechist says, always resist firmly our enemies until we finally obtain the complete victory. It is the final answer to this prayer that in the future all our enemies will be defeated and we will be victorious in Christ. So will we be rewarded for our trust in the Lord's preserving grace. On that day, our victory is complete. So we sum up this petition as a prayer. I am weak, but thou art strong. Jesus, keep me from all wrong.